message here this morning. Please join me in a word of prayer. We pray to the Holy Spirit because it is the, it's the, it's the breath that's uh, upon the scriptures that makes them come alive. <clears throat> Comforter in heaven, we thank you for your holiness. You are holy in every way. We are not. You wrote the scriptures. You preserved them. You organized them with chapters and verses. And you edited that we get just the, your purified word. When we are in you, and when you are upon us, and when you are upon your word, and when we are submitted to you, and when we bow before you, and we give everything over to you, and we trust in you, then we are in you. And that is the only time, that's the only time that we can join in your righteousness. Visit upon us this morning in Yeshua's name. Amen. So, um, I mentioned last week about uh, that, uh, you know, that some of the basic problems in life. Um, and I mentioned that um, things that are common to all human beings, that that there is the male affliction, which is anxiety, and the female affliction, which is insecurity. Well, I'm very familiar with the anxiety part. I mean, uh, but, but uh, this week I wanted to, I was pondering this, and I was asking my wife Susan to, uh, I wanted to learn more about how does this work on a, on a personal, intimate point of view, the inner, how does, uh, what's, what's the inner part of it? Because Really, I, 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 don't, I don't really experience this insecurity. Now, maybe, or maybe I do a bit, but I'm not aware of it. And so I wanted to learn more about it. But, but the anxiety part, well, I know all about that. I mean, I've been living with it all my life. You see, anxiety is, is um, a concern over an unknown outcome. How am I going to do it? Will I be able to perform? Can I achieve it? And so on and so forth. Now, if you got a good woman, she can help in this regard. And she says, oh, my hero. Ooh, ah, how wonderful thou art. You can do anything. And you see that it's all assuages the male anxiety. Uh, but having been afflicted with this, and I know that to one degree or another, men in general are, uh, to one, to, uh, to the, that it causes me, anyhow, to peer out on the horizon, but continually, I am continually spending my thought life out on the horizon. What's going to be? How's it going to turn out? What will, what will, how will history turn? Will this person do that? Will this event happen? Who's going to get elected? I mean, uh, it's always out on the horizon. And so my, uh, I spent a great deal of thought out there. And that's, you know, that's fine because then you're, you're always, as, a, as an analytical person, not creative, but an analytical person, uh, is, is, is busy dissecting, quantifying, uh, and uh, uh, wanting to numerically figure things out. And, you know, it's tiring this peering out on the horizon all the time. But you do, but, and you think you're getting better at it. The problem is the more that you, the more that you indulge the anxiety, you know, you think you're going to make it better, but actually <laughs> you're making it worse because, because it's, it's really not resting in the Lord, um, which is the, you know, the better prescription. So that, uh, but let's, let's assume that there is a benefit to trying to discern the future. Good to discern it in prayer, actually, it would be the best way. But it leaves us in a situation of waiting. Waiting. Always waiting. What's it going to be? How is it going to turn out? When is it going to happen? And so on. And this waiting issue is what I want to talk about this morning. Waiting. Because it is so much a part of our lives. It seems like we're always waiting for something. Something that is going to happen. I know it's going to happen, but when's it going to happen? I'm, uh, you know, it's, it's like, it, 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 now, Lord? Uh, what, no, that was a false start. Well, 
you know, when is it going to happen? When, when, is my, when is my Boaz, when, when is my spouse going to come along? Uh, when, is my, when, when is that investment going to pay off? When is that land going to sell? When, when is this? Uh, everything's on when. I'm waiting. Oh, Lord, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for years and years and so on. And so I wanted to dwell upon this issue of life, which has to do with waiting. So who, who, how can we find out from the scriptures about, about waiting? Uh, and, uh, well, there's examples in the scriptures. I mean, visualize, you know, we know Joseph. Joseph was 13 years, you know, he's in prison, he's waiting. He didn't know he's ever going to get out. He didn't know his, but he's standing in faith that life's going to get better. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure he had his bad moments, and he's waiting. He's waiting for something to happen. Even after, even after he gets the promise from, uh, from the baker and the, and the wine taster, you know, he's still a couple of years waiting, waiting, always waiting, you know. What about Abraham? You know, he's gonna, got this great promise of destiny for his progeny and so on and so forth, and he's waiting. He's 75 years old. Huh? And, uh, what about, and what about Sarah? She's way past menopause, right? But they're... They're going to have it, a child, and so on and so forth. So, but uh, he's, he, you know, he's, he's 99 years old by the time this happens. Well, that's a lot of waiting for an old man. Huh? So there's, there's waiting, waiting, and so on. Well, there's waiting for us, too. But there's, a, there's another one who waited longer, and that's Noah. <laughs> and Noah, I couldn't think of anybody... Who, who, who had a, big, a, a bigger task of waiting than Noah. Let's turn to chapter 6 of the book of Genesis and verse 13. Um, we know the story, but let's go over it a little uh, anyhow. It says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Um, so uh, God's fed up. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms that thou shalt make of the ark shall be pit, have pitch. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is the fashion which you shall make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. Now a cubit is uh, variously estimated to be between 18 and 22 inches. Let's call it a foot and a half. So this, uh, this ark is 300 cubits, is 450 feet long. Uh, the breadth of it is 50 cubits, that's 75 feet wide, and the height is 30 cubits, 40, uh, that's, uh, well, my goodness, 30 cubits times a foot and a half is 45, you know, that's, that's like a four-story house. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and, and the door of the ark, shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower second third stories uh, shalt thou make it now there's an architectural plan for you well this is this these are the specifications that he's been given and he's got to make this thing work verse 17 says and behold I even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is on the earth shall die. Okay. But with thee I shall establish my covenant. So, um, okay. Big flood coming, but with you, I got a special, I got a special deal for you. Uh, and Because you're going to come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and every living thing, all flesh, Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. And then it talks about the fowls of the air and the cattle and so on and so forth. Every creeping thing shall come uh, in, in as well. Uh, and take with you all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now that's a project. I mean, you've got to build this thing, and uh, you don't got a lot of helpers. 
Okay. Where is that gopher wood? Where can I find the gopher wood? Will you help me make the pitch, dear? Uh, so, so he's he's got a project on his. Can you imagine how he's got to gather these animals? Well, you know, it's going to take a long time to make this ark. Let's not gather the animals first. Let's let that be towards the end. Also, we got to feed these animals if we're going to take them in, and that's a lot of food. I mean. It, for, you know, for all all of these all these groupings, we got to have food. So let's let's make the ark first, and let's take care of the uh, the provisions for these uh, gathering the animals. But he's got to gather two of each of these uh, phylum together, and uh, and feed them. Big task, big task. Chapter seven says, and the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou unto all uh, the house of the ark for. For I have seen your righteousness before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take three by sevens, the male and the female, and the beasts that are not clean by twos. Well, we forget about that. We always think that everything that's going to be gathered into the ark is, is, is in twos. But this verse says, well, wait, if, it, if, if it's a clean animal, if it's kosher, if it's a clean animal, then it's supposed to be sevens. Hmm. Not cleans are twos, male and female. I guess uh, he's he could keep that mathematics, but you know, if you're talking about every species, you know, it's a lot to keep track of. Uh, that, 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 only two of those. No, sorry. I raised it from a no, two. <laughs> Of the fowls of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep thy seed alive upon the face of the earth. And yet for seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made I will destroy from the face of the earth. So he's saying in seven days there's going to come a, uh, a big time rain upon uh, the earth. Now there are, there are some theories about, about this event. And they're pretty credible theories, but they're only theories. Uh, I think the uh, perhaps uh, one that's uh, fairly well accepted is that there is that there was a a, a great meteor that came and, and and pierced the ice shield in the atmosphere. And the reason for that is because that that's caused the rain. All right. And that after that time, okay, the aging process changed because the uh, the photosynthesis process changed, because with the with the piercing of the ice shield, of the ice shield, all right, uh, photosynthesis happens because of a combination of light and uh, carbon dioxide, and it changes the production of sugar. Uh, in all in all plant life, that's photosynthesis. Okay, so you've got you've got water, you've got air, you've got carbon dioxide, all right, uh, and and the combination thereof. And as that would change, that would change the the photos the the photosynthesis within the plants, and that is what caused the life, the length of life to change, because. Noah, you know, he lives like 650 years. People lived a long time, and that's an explanation for that. Could be. We don't know. But there's another speculation, and that is that the reason why the Pacific Basin, the Pacific Ocean floor, is a lot deeper than the Atlantic Ocean, and it's much more expansive. And so the theory is that something broke off, came down, broke, pierced the, the ice shield, went and carved out this tremendous basin uh, the Pacific Basin, and that that's what took place, uh, and that after that time, instead of moisture coming upon the plants, okay, just by in the air, so to speak, now it, it was going to work differently. There was going to be rain, but notice before this time, there's no mention of rain. The time of Noah is approximately 3,000. B.C. or B.C.E. before the Common Era. So that's a long time. That's a, a thousand years. There was no rain, and now suddenly thereafter, there's going to be rain. 
and these uh, scientific ex uh, speculations, you know, they, they are just that. They're just speculations. But not bad. I mean, they do, they, you know, it, it has a certain logic to it. Well, we continue on, and it says in verse 5 of chapter 7, it says, And Noah did according unto all that the Lord had commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters walked upon the earth. So Noah's got some 50 years left to live after the, after the flood comes. All right, And so Noah did a lot of waiting. Can you picture uh, what life was like talk about being politically incorrect. I mean, everybody's off having a great old time. The depravity ran completely without, without uh, restriction. And, uh, but he's leading a completely different life than everybody else. He and his family. Now, train up a child in a way they should go. Training the children. I mean, here they are. The entire society is doing all kinds of terrible, terrible things. Uh, the depravity is, 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 is run, running wild, but the children, they must have believed, Dad, that there was a promise coming, okay, and that, and that, that we're going to spend our time making this ark and so on and so forth. I want you kids as a family enterprise. I want you kids to chip in here and uh, help your mom and help me too. You know, I'm not, I'm not too young, right? I'm 600 years old. Uh, and... Uh, but there's going, to be, there's going to be blessing in it because God has made a covenant with me. Oh, yeah, Dad, I wasn't there. Take my word for it, son. I got a covenant coming, and the covenant will be for me. But, but you're, gonna, you're participants in it, too, because God has said that we should all enter the ark together. So whatever is going to be for me is going to be for you, too. So the children also have to exhibit a great measure of faith because they're called upon to give their lives to this project that Dad says was authorized. They weren't there. It doesn't say that, that, that God spoke unto Noah and his children. He just spoke to Noah. So the children have to take Dad's word for it. Okay. So they're waiting. And everybody's laughing at them. Everybody's laughing at them. People are, uh, you know... You get, are you going to be passing by the ark? <laughs> that fool's still at it. Yeah. And the kids, what is with the kids? You know, they're not enjoying themselves at all. They're busy making pitch all day from the time they're little kids and, and so on and so forth. They're busy making pitch and, 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 and uh, gopher wood and so on and so forth. You know, they're just being made fun of. They're being ridiculed. Huh? Talk about, talk about re social reproach. They got it. And so they're... They're waiting on a hope, and they're actually spending their entire lives, they're spending their entire lives in this project on the presumption that Dad actually did hear from God, and we're going to take his word for it. So you say, well, oh, why? why? Why would they do that? I mean, could, what about the doubt? You know, I, Dad, maybe I could just go over with my friends over here. No, don't hang out with any friends. They're all of the depraved model. So, no, we're just the family enterprise. Stay with the family. Don't go visit. You don't, you don't need friends. There's going to be this flood. Okay? So that's, that's, the, family, that's the family situation, and it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty dire. Now, uh, now Noah... He has, he, has, he has his own problems with this. He's, he's heard a voice. But am I, am I in delusion? What, what is it? And so on. It's important to remember that this happens about 3,000 BCE, if you trace it back through the scriptures, because Noah at 3,000 BCE is 600 years old when, this is, uh, when the flood comes. All right? And he was working 120 years years you know uh, you know he's he's working a long time on this on this ark it's a long time but that means he wasn't that far it wasn't that far from adam 4000 bce 3000 bce 600 years of life he was within 400 years of adam you know i mean he was 
he was uh, so it, 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 there there weren't that many generations. He was let's say within three four generations of so the stories coming from the Garden of Eden and and and, and stories about God were very real to him, even though he did not have the scriptures. He didn't have songs to sing, right? He didn't have psalms. He didn't have any writings. The Torah was nowhere in sight. All right, but he was, but he was. Um, not that many generations from, from the source generation. So, they're waiting. And they were rewarded, ultimately, for their waiting. But it was, uh, it was a hard task, but ultimately came the reward. How big a reward? Well, for all the ridicule, all the slander, um, actually, Noah became king of the earth. We don't think of him as a king, but he actually became a king because everything that came after him was under his purview. So like Adam, he had authority over all the animals, right? He saved them, right? And he had authority over all his family and their progeny, and he was the head deal, and no one had authority on planet Earth higher than that of Noah. He became king of the Earth. That's a reward. That's a reward. For what? Well, for building the ark, but also for waiting. Because the waiting was an evidence of faith. The waiting was an evidence of faith. And, and well, all right. So he got rewarded, uh, and he got saved uh, because, of his, because of his willingness to wait, which was an evidence of faith. So we have, we have other things that, uh, you know, we're, life is not so terribly different for us, all right? We also have to do a lot of waiting. But the scriptures comment for us about, about our waiting. So let's, uh, let's look at the Psalms. It, says, it tells us a few things about our waiting, all right? I'm going to turn to uh, the 25th Psalm, verse 5. It says, lead me in thy truth and teach me. Thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all day long. So we also are going to be in this waiting ministry. But one of the things this psalm tells us is, is that the waiting teaches us. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. That in the waiting, there is a teaching. So while we're all waiting for our ship to come in, waiting for our graduation, waiting for our business opportunity to finally materialize, waiting to get paid on this and that, but it's all waiting, 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 and we're all in the process of waiting. The Lord is using the waiting to teach us things. So there is a profit in the waiting because we're learning as we're waiting. So let's go on with uh, ver uh, chapter 27, 14 also speaks about this waiting. Wait upon the Lord. He, uh, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, O Lord. So here we see that in the case of waiting, we're encouraged to wait, but it says he shall strengthen your heart. So in the waiting, we're gaining strength. How, how can it possibly be that I am gaining strength while I'm waiting? it would seem as though I'm getting weaker because it's harder to do. I mean, it's easier to fall into despair because I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and nothing's happening, and I'm waiting. And then there's the delay. Oh, the delay. Oh, my goodness. It seems like there's always a delay. And the first delay is like the airlines. The first delay is only the beginning of sorrows. Usually, if you get that first delay, there's going to be more delays beyond that. Right? But not to worry because it strengthens us because... We say, I can't take it. I just can't take it anymore. And the Lord quietly whispers to us in an inarticulate way, you don't know what you can take. You don't know what you can take. I'm going to show you what you can take. And he does. And it turns out we can. And after we do, we've learned something about ourselves that we really can take it. And we feel stronger because, hey, I waited, you know, I waited five years. I waited a year and a half. I waited three weeks, and I didn't think I could wait three weeks. I, I'm waiting to get better. 
And, and better, I'm in, ex I'm in real pain, and two weeks just is more than what I can bear. You don't know what you can bear. Uh, and then after you do it, you say, yeah, you know what, I, I did that. I, I did that. You know, our self-respect grows by virtue of the fact that we actually did something we didn't think we were capable of. So we're strengthened. We're strengthened. We feel stronger because we are stronger. We have demonstrated to ourselves, to the Lord, to the world at large, that we can take it. We can take it better than we thought that they thought. Okay? But the Lord knew how much we could take. He says, I'm not going to give you anything more to take than what you can handle, and I know what you can handle. Don't go by what you think you can handle. I know what you can handle, and I'm not going to push you beyond what you can handle. So the waiting, I'm in charge of your waiting. I'm in charge of your waiting. Okay. I know what you can take. You don't know what you can take, but I'm not going to push you beyond your limits. But we're going to test and be sure that you can fulfill all of your potential in this waiting business. Yeah. And I know that there's been a lot of people out there, maybe, I don't know, maybe everybody, who's been, who's been caused to wait for something beyond what they thought they were capable of. And then when they do it, they feel stronger because they are stronger because God has shown them that they're stronger than they think they are. Well, waiting upon the Lord. I'm just not waiting for some cosmic circumstance to happen by happenstance that maybe it'll come in and maybe, you know, a roll of the dice and so on and so forth. When we wait upon the Lord, when we wait upon the Lord, we have an edge. We have an edge over the other people who are waiting. The other people are saying, well, life is random. And, uh, you know, if randomly my, my ship comes in, if randomly there's a buyer uh, for the house, if randomly there is a, uh, you know, a, a healing for myself, no, but, when, but you see, we have an edge because we don't say randomly. We say, ah, my God cares for me. My God's watching what's going on. My God is interested, and he is the orchestrator and author of my destiny. And therefore, I can hang on. I can hang on a little bit longer. I can go the distance with God because God is going to see to it that he fulfills his promise that I'm not going to have to endure more than what I'm capable of what he designed me for. And so I can wait. I'll wait just another day. I'll wait just another week. I'll wait just another month. And before you know it, we have outweighed far beyond what we thought that we could do. Far beyond what we thought we could do. And the best part of it is, is, is we say, you know, I, I, we had an edge. We, we could do something that, we, that other people couldn't do. Why? Because we had confidence in God. And that confidence in God is being expressed in our waiting. The waiting is an act of faith. It's an act of faith. And other people who don't got it, they're weak. They're weaker. They don't got, they don't got the stuff. They can't go that extra mileage. And it's a separation thing because they don't got the faith. They don't have the confidence in God that God will see to it. Talk about insecurity. I think a lot of this political correctness has to do with insecurity. Oh, I hope everybody loves me. Oh, everybody's got to approve me. Oh, I better not, I better not do that because then they're going to criticize me. And I better not be subject to criticism because then everyone won't like me. I need to be approved by everybody. You see, you see what I mean? You're, you're just subject to the winds of everybody's approval or disapproval. I better be politically correct. That's no oh, shame, shame on you. You're no good because you, you offended. Oh, I better not offend anybody. And so where's the strength in that? Where's the strength in it? I have to hold my finger in the air and see which way the wind is blowing? Even if I'm a congressman or a senator, I, 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 yeah, if I, if I go this way, they'll all approve me and they'll reelect me. Uh, uh, that's today. But tomorrow, uh, the wind has changed, and I now have to change all my views. My friends, those are not leaders. Those are followers. They put their finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing. And I'm, it's really too bad that the people that we elect to be leaders are actually followers. Followers out of their own insecurity. Oh my goodness, what's going to be with me? Is somebody going to pull the rug out from under me? And then I will no longer be elected. And then what will be with me? I'll have to be a regular lawyer. Oh my goodness, I'm going to lose all that status. Oh my goodness, the campaign funds. I won't, I won't even be able to raise any campaign funds. I won't be able to do things for people that get bribes. Uh, uh, contributions, excuse me. So the, it's, it, it's, it's insecurity. It is insecurity on the, on the part of leaders and other people. 
all of us, to the extent that we must try to be politically correct, I think it's connected with insecurity. When's the rug going to be pulled out from under me? I better be very careful to be approved of. You can't be a leader and be with, with this political correctness because the definition of a leader, at least my definition, is somebody who can correctly identify a direction and who's willing to pay the price to carry it out. Okay, no matter what political party you are, no matter what, what cause, if you want to be a leader, you got to have those two qualities. You got to be somebody who can correctly identify a direction, all right, and who's willing to pay the price, no matter what anybody thinks, I'm going on with the Lord. Noah was that guy. So real leadership is being willing to stand alone. That's backbone. Where do you get your backbone? You get your backbone from the Lord. I, as for me and my house, I'm going to stand with the Lord. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. I'm going on with the Lord. I'm going to do it. That's all there is to it. I'm, I'm settled, and you can say what you want. You can do what you want. I'm, I, I'm hanging in. That's what I'm doing with my life. Have you noticed? That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going on with the Lord, and, you know, I can explain to you how I have this strength. If you want to listen. Oh, you're afraid to listen? Okay. But basically, I've decided for myself and my friends, we've decided for ourselves that we're not only going on with the Lord, okay, but if the Lord should say that we need to tarry, Job said, okay, should the Lord tarry, yea, though he slay me, I'm waiting and I got slain. So what? I waited. I did my part. Now it's up to the Lord to do his part. But the waiting is a very big part of our doing our part. Sometimes we don't got to do nothing. Just wait. That's our job, is to wait. He's going to pull all the levers anyhow, but the hard part is the waiting. When's my husband coming to be a believer? I'm waiting. I'm waiting 20 years. It's okay, dear. That's part of your job is to wait. Why? Because it's teaching you something. Because it's strengthening you. You're benefiting from the waiting. So, my dear, it may be that he becomes a believer, and it may just be that you, are un that you are actually benefiting because it is working on your character. And your character is what your life is all about. It isn't a matter of what you did. Forget about what you did. Okay? What's important to God is what you become. And I am so thankful for that. I mean, I just don't want to take what I did to heaven with me. It wouldn't be allowed in. <laughs> but hopefully what I become... I become a follower in Yeshua. And, yeah, I become a follower in Yeshua. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know, it's the power of salvation to all of us who have come to believe. huh? And that's, that's who I've become. I have hidden myself in his righteousness. I hide myself in it, just get me in however I can fit just a little bit. And, but I'm in that... I'm in that crevice. I'm in that, that cranny. I, I'm part of it. I'm part of his righteousness, so I'm, I'm, I'm saved. I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And that's enough. That's enough to keep us going, to say, all right, I'm in. Thank God I'm in. Literally, thank God I'm in. And you know what? If I got to wait, God's going to use that to teach me and to strengthen me. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm in for that. Yeah, Psalm 62, our last Psalm tells us one, tells us something else about that. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. So in the waiting, that's how we get through the waiting. It's hard. It's hard to get through the waiting. How can we do it? Well, when our expectation is that God is not going to cheat us for the waiting. What do you mean, cheat us? Well, you waited, and it just took a long time, and so what? God doesn't say, so what? Huh? No, he's a rewarder of all who diligently seek him, and God's justice is exceedingly fine, down to the last detail is his justice. Complete, complete, ex scales with exactitude. 
you did more waiting, you get more credit. I mean, it, it's, it, it, it's exquisite. The, the mathematics, the bookkeeping is, is completely comprehensive and to the greatest degree possible, to an infinite degree. And so if you pay an extra price, huh? that's all calculated in. It's all baked in who you become and your destiny. Oh, yeah. I want to I want to concentrate a little bit here. Uh, that uh, Isaiah says that in uh, chapter forty and verse uh, thirty one says that we will renew our strength. Th those that wait upon the Lord, that's us. We shall renew our strength, and we shall mount up as wings as eagles. We're not just going to be doping along, you know, dragging ourselves through life. No, we're going to have renewed energy. We're going to have more energy than we did in the first place. You would think that you'll be bogged down with the waiting. Huh? Losing energy. The balloon is, is losing helium, shrinking. Oh, I'm waiting. I'm getting weaker. I'm getting weaker. No. The scriptures say that we who wait upon the Lord, we are going to have a renewed amount of strength. Oh, renewed. New. That has new but it's renewed. So we're gonna, we're, it's going to be new again. That's renewed. It's going to be new again and again and again. That our strength shall be renewed. That's re-upping our strength all the time. Our strength is being re-upped the longer that we have to wait. Our strength, we, it seems like we would be getting weaker, but we're actually getting stronger the longer we wait. Yeah, that's it. God said so. They shall mount up with, with eagle's wings. Okay, that means we're going to be soaring. So, can it, is it possible to be waiting for years and be soaring? Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. In the Lord, it is possible to be under extreme pressure and soar. Why? Because the extreme pressure will cause us to take refuge in the Holy Spirit. And when we take refuge in the Holy Spirit, that's when we soar i got to have some more refuge because I'm going to soar higher. I need to get out of this present mindset that says that I'm getting weaker and it's getting harder and so on and so on. I'm going back to my hiding place. I'm going to hide myself in the Lord, in my crevice, in my cranny of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the more I do that, the higher I'm going to get. So, if I come to services, hopefully, if everything works well with the music and, and I listen to this guy and he talks to me for... Hopefully only 45 minutes. You know, maybe I'll be elevated. All right. And then I go for the Oneg Shabbat, and I have my refreshments with my friends, and people are, are in the spirit and so on and so on. Well, that's another 45 minutes. And I feel elevated at the end of an hour and a half or two hours. I walk out of here elevated. I'm with a bunch of people who are in the Holy Spirit, right? And I feel elevated. Now, just take a look. If that's what can happen in a couple of hours, what happens if we hide ourselves in the Lord for six hours or eight hours or a month and a half? In heaven, we got nothing else to do. Morning, noon, and nighttime. Nothing except to worship the Lord. Nothing to praise the Lord. Nothing to talk about uh, fellowship and, and, and listening to testimonies and singing to the Lord. That's it. And so what will happen is, is we're not limited to two hours or four hours or eight hours. It's all the time. So we will be in a situation of continually being elevated. And I'm standing there, and it's now been three weeks, and I'm still in the Lord, but I'm higher than I was on the first day. And, and then I'm saying to myself, this is never going to stop. That means I'm going to get, I'm always going to be in a situation of getting higher. Next year, I'm going to be higher than I am this year. And a and hundred years from now, I'm going to be even higher than I am a year from now. And a thousand years from now, I'm going to be higher than a hundred years from now. And I am in a situation of, without end, always getting higher and higher. And that alone makes me high. The, the idea that, I, that, 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 my, that I'm continually going to be elevated from now until eternity until I can't take it anymore. I just can't take it anymore. It's so heavy, and so on and so on. So th to hide myself from the great light, the great joy, it's just so much, I'm overwhelmed. No wonder I'm casting my crown before the feet of the Lord, because, you know, is there anything? It's, it's hard to imagine. I had not seen or ear heard what our future is, but our future is to be 
not encouraged in a minor way like when we go to services, but on an ever-increasing basis throughout all of eternity. And we will have so much, so much to praise the Lord about. Praise the Lord that I'm even here getting blessed. Oh, my goodness. But what about this life? What about this life? Ah, it just seems like sometimes that the waiting, are you sure, Paul, that the Lord takes into consideration that waiting longer you get more credit for? Are you sure about that, Paul? Well, I, you know, I have, my, I have something for you to consider in this, in this regard, okay? Uh, the Lord does have an economy. He has mathematics, okay? And uh, there's an interesting scripture uh, that, that, I, that I think of when I begin to say, what about waiting longer versus waiting shorter, okay? And it comes from Leviticus 27.31. I know you all know what that is. The old familiar Leviticus 27.31 says, and, a, and if a man will all redeem out of his tithes, he shall add unto thee three-fifths part thereof, a, a, a fifth part thereof. So it's a little off the subject, but it does, it's a mathematical point that I hang on to. What it's saying is that let's say, um, let's say I grow a crop. And I say, you know, I'm just not going to do the tithing this time. God will understand. Okay. But I owe that tithe to God. 10%. I mean, I, I grew wheat. 10% I should, I should give away to the Levites. Okay. But I didn't do it this time. And then later, I think to myself, you know, I remember a year and a half ago that I didn't do that. And, you know, things are not working out for me so good. Maybe I, maybe I should have done that. Maybe I need to make it right. And God says, you can make it right. Okay. But you'll have to add a fifth part thereof. That's 20%. So should we call that interest? Uh, a fifth part thereof? So... There, so I, there are circumstances where God pays, where God calculates interest. All right. Well, but suppose I grow a crop of wheat, great farmer that I am, and that takes three months. I don't know how long it takes. Anybody here know how long it takes to grow a crop? Three months? Go with me on three months. All right. And now I fail to give my tithe, okay? Now it's barley time. Uh, you know, in Israel, they, they now can grow up to 12 crops a year in different rotation, 12. But let's just say that I now grow some barley, and I don't quite get a, around to giving my tithe on that one either. So let me see. I, I owe 20% on the wheat, and I owe 20% on the barley. But let's say there's four crops a year, and I'm accumulating penalty. I'm accu so there's a 20% interest factor. Okay, now I'm looking at it and I'm saying, well, wait a minute. If, if it's possible for God to collect interest on delinquency, is it, not, is it not reasonable for me to speculate that God pays interest for waiting in faith? I can get my head around that. I hope maybe you can too. Because, you know, it's one thing to have to pay a penalty for being late. But if that's so, and God makes such a calculation that way, why can't that work in our favor, whereby we accrue interest for delay in waiting? That would say if I wait longer, I get interest. 20% is a good number. I like the rate of return, 20%. So let's say, so in my mind, in my mind, waiting at a 20 that's a very good investment a 20% interest rate. Huh? But let's say there's four crops a year. So it's not 20% a year. Maybe that's four times 20% penalty. Huh? But So I don't know how it will work out, but I like the concept that it works inside out, whereby we're rewarded for waiting longer. Oh, good. I, wait, I get to wait longer. I don't got to wait three years. I can wait longer. Oh, shucks. I, 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 my waiting's over after three years. Oh, my goodness gracious. I could have gotten more credit. But 
somehow after you've waited three years, you don't think about that. You just say, hallelujah, finally my faith has been rewarded. Hallelujah. So I like this idea that, that there's interest paid according to how long we have to exhibit faith. It's a reward for faith. And if you're waiting for a year and a half instead of two months, you're entitled to more reward. You hung in there longer with the Lord. And he is, he is, he, he's not a cheat. He's going to reward us in, 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 with exactitude. So that, let's say somebody is waiting for five years, ten years. They're going to get, they're going to be, that, that, and you hang with it. You hang with it. You know, that's, that's quite a lot of faith. And that's, that's worth more to God, it would seem to me, than somebody who's waiting a week and a half. So the waiting actually is profitable. So being a former businessman, I like the idea of a 20% return. I like it as an investment. And I, say, and I say to myself, well, I don't like waiting. It's hard on my flesh. But in the waiting, as I wait longer, the reward is growing. The reward is going to be bigger by virtue of waiting. God has stored up something bigger because I waited. It's a bigger prize, and I paid a bigger price, and there's a bigger reward. So I begin to calibrate that there is something with this waiting and the size of the reward. Mm, I, like, I like it. I dwell upon it. I count on it. One last scripture. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.12. 2 Timothy 1.12. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know that in whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Which day? The day that we exit this flesh and go to him. The day of our reward, that's the day. So, it says, Paul says that he's persuaded. If he's persuaded, I'm persuaded. That he is able to keep that. So, this is, this is a savings account. We are living this life with the idea of a savings account. We come to become, we come and we, we become believers, okay? And in the beginning, it seems as though we're asked for very little. And we do, and we yield to God. And as we yield to God, we're asked for a little more. God's developing our faith muscle, okay? And so that faith muscle grows by virtue of it being exercised. But all of those things which we have done, all of those things, are going into our eternal savings account, which bears interest according to some calculation. I think it's 20% may be conservative, but there is, God, God's justice is exceedingly fine, okay? Here we have John Kaufman, okay? Feels inspired to put signs on, on the windows of his car so the people should know, this is who I am. I am with, I'm with the people where Jews and Gentiles come together in fulfillment of the scriptures. I want, I want all you people in Palm Springs to know that. Suggest it. Huh? I mean, that was not part of any sermon I ever gave. I don't know anybody else. Yeah, but, but we have Donzel Jones, who, who kind of inspired it, because Donzel Jones, years ago, put all, the script, put, put all kinds of scriptures, salvation scriptures, and painted them on his car. And John and Donzel... The, our pals, and, they, and they're together in the street ministry. And so John got inspired to do this. All right? He's taking something with him of that into his eternal bank account. Here we have, here we have uh, Claudia and Russell. They're with the street ministry. Huh? All right. Not every week somebody becomes a believer. But some weeks, about one, once, one out of every four weeks, and John, John is the originator of that also. All right, well, they're doing something. 
There's the, and the, 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 then we do, we have, we have the street fair ministry, and we have all of these different things that people are doing. Why are they doing it? Because on some kind of a semi-conscious level, we are saying, I'm doing this for the Lord, and we have an intuitive sense that it all counts, and none of it is disregarded. Frank, he has, he has a ministry in downtown Palm Springs where all he does is he sits there and witnesses to people as people come up and back, walking back and forth and back and forth, and after a while they get curious, and they sit down with them. He doesn't have to grab them by the collar. They're curious. Why are you doing this? Huh? And he's so, so happy to say, well, I'm serving, you know, I, I, let me explain to you about, about the Messiah. Okay? On a semi-conscious, semi-intuitive level, when we're doing all of these things for the Lord, we are, we are saying inwardly, I'm storing up my treasure in heaven. I'm storing up my treasure. The scriptures say that where our treasure is, so therein our heart will be also. Okay, if I take that quite literally, which I do, all right, if I'm storing up, people say, oh, I'm storing up money. No, forget about the money. Okay, it has to do with storing up treasure, spiritual treasure, the spiritual treasure of being of service, of helping God's program along, of, of, of being instrumental in it, which gives us a measure of joy in this life, but it's adding to our savings account. And as we put that treasure and we store it away into an eternal keep, keeping place, okay, our hearts increasingly are where our treasure is. So if our treasure is that we've done this piece of service and that's a treasure in heaven and we just keep storing, storing up spiritual treasure, storing up spiritual treasure, storing up spiritual treasure, as we're doing that, not only is there a benefit in the next lifetime, okay, but we're drawing closer to God because of our investment. We want increasingly to be where our spiritual treasure is. So as we serve the Lord, it draws us closer and closer to wanting to be with him, waiting for heaven, and saying to ourselves, Lord, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. I, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Life is, this, this life, I'm tired of it already. Huh? Can we get on to the next stage? Not yet, my boy. <laughs> It's true. You know, some older folks, you know what I'm talking about. So, and you know, life can seem long and hard to younger people, too. They're waiting and waiting and waiting. So we have spiritual treasure. We store it up. It's in a safe keeping place for us. It's all remembered, every single one. For Hebrews 10, 6 says, For is God so unfair, is God so unjust, as to forget any one of our good deeds. That's not Paul speaking. That's the scriptures he's quoting. Is God so unfair as to forget any one of them? They're all stored up. They're all sitting there waiting for us. Our treasure is there. We're just not, we're, we're, we're just not, we're just not seeing it. However, our faith sees it. Our eyes of faith see that it's a very real thing. That it's a very real, it's a very real account. It's being very well kept. The score is being very well kept. Huh? And, and my account is secure. Everything else may be insecure, but that account is secure. And, that, and that's what I'm doing with my life. And you other fools in the world, you may think I'm the fool, but, but you don't get it. And I wish I could help you with that, and I'll help you if I can. But basically, I'm going on. I want my savings account. I want to fatten up that savings account all the time. And so if I live longer, more opportunity to fatten up my savings account. Hallelujah. Oh, he cares. And he's watching. And when he calls us to do, upon us to do something, he's, he's saying to us, do this. Go here. Go there. Be good for you. Go ahead. Give it a try. Yeah. Volunteer. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. And we say, well, I can do that. I can do that. I think I would like to make God a present. You make God a present. Man, you have put, you put some treasure in your storehouse. Let's close in a word of prayer. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Lord, we do thank you for the concept of waiting, 
that we wait upon you, and that there is a sure benefit for us, a benefit in this life and in the next. Strengthen us. Help us with this waiting. And Lord, we do count on your very, very good arithmetic. We count on it. For this, we bet our lives. Thank you for this time together in Yeshua's name. Amen.